Yeah. Up until 11.30? Yeah, that's what we Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, what I'm doing in this collection of essays and in this book is a bit unusual uh, for me because I'm actually a normative and a constructive political theorist. And much of my work in the last, you know, years, be it uh, the rights of others, be it uh, another cosmopolitanism, uh, dignity and adversity, my last three books, is about um, uh, basically uh, constructing a universalist position that is also cognizant of diversity. Uh, I'm having fun in this book a little bit. Uh, it's me also working less as a constructive political theorist with her own position, which I do have, but more as a kind of intellectual historian, one more time maybe engaging uh, with thinkers whom I really like and enjoy. Okay? Except I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say about Isaiah Berlin. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a big chapter on Isaiah Berlin and Max Weber, and uh, um, you know the disconnection is not made. And Isaiah Berlin is always treated as the patron saint of uh, um, uh, pluralism. But back to your comments. So, in some ways, I mean, I can understand your frustration about what am I doing uh, just at the at the end. But maybe I can tie the pieces together. You know, one defense that I'm going to make is saying that you know the, the the chapter is more exegetical and playful than decisive but at least I can try to answer the questions that uh, that you raise um, about Annabelle's comments um, uh, I like uh, bringing in the question of tradition and its relationship to the problem of the beginning and I like very much the subtle way in which you know you brought together uh, the uh, question of tradition and iterability. But I have one difficulty, and the difficulty is this. I think there could be a danger about reifying the concept of tradition, because again and again, you know, what Arendt talks about is uh, uh, basically uh, that uh, in that essay, if I recall correctly as well, she talks about the necessity of acting when the authority of tradition is lost. She is not, and I don't think you imply that, she's not a traditionalist, nor is she seeking to recuperate or retrieve tradition, but she's trying to deal with the paradoxes of politics when the authority of tradition can no longer be taken for granted. And much of the discussion in that essay is about the Roman understanding of, of um, uh, authority. And I think uh, we read Arendt today, um, and it's surprising that uh, we read her again and again, precisely because we are at such a point when, after sort of the end of uh, Marxism in a way, it may be coming back in the mind of Yanis Varoufakis and the Greek crisis. Certainly, Marxism as a critique of political economy is not over, but as a normative uh, theory of how to organize politics, it's over. But after the end of Marxism and the kind of the continuing, the continuing inability of liberalism, it seems to answer our deepest perplexities, we sort of go back, you know, to our end because there's some thinking there about the political which is neither quite left nor right, um, neither conservative nor just revolutionary. There is, there is some, something that I think, there is some dignity of the political that we are all missing. And that's why we go back to Arendt. And the contemporary world, if anything, is just the situation is getting uh, worse and worse. So in that sense, I just want to say, um, yes, uh, it's important to recall Arendt on tradition, but not Arendt as a traditionalist. Or, and I don't think you meant it that way because you're, you were very dialectical in bringing in the concept, uh, the concept of Aufhebung and the relationship between tradition and reason. Now, having said this, why is she concerned about the question of beginnings in politics? 
what, what the relationship of law and politics because for her, and think of this metaphor, law is either a wall or a fence. It is not a command. It's something that divides and separates. And in that, uh, in that way, law is always the house that builds politics. But of course, politics is also the house that gives, you know, the politics is the process that gives the law the cement and the mortar, you know? It's just otherwise it doesn't. Why is she concerned about the question of beginnings? Well, I think the answer, uh, obviously, from a, an interpretive point of view, is the danger of totalitarianism. Uh, because um, uh, whether she was right or wrong about the French Revolution, she did establish a connection between uh, the instability of the revolutionary moment. She, and she analogized the, the, the French and the, uh, I think the Russian revolutions in this, uh, in this respect, for her, this, this problem that the revolution can devour its children is extremely important. Because, I mean, there is no politics if there is no risk of the new, if there is no openness. And all politics for her is the principle of the arche, the principle of the beginning. And yet there is also this danger uh, that uh, uh, how, do you, how, do you sp uh, how do you stabilize this originary opening this originary um, also moment that, that contains its, its, uh, its, its violence. And uh, you know, uh, here in Israel, you maybe forgot him, or maybe you still remember him, the famous analysis of Jacob Talmud, mm -hmm. the origins of, you know, on the dictatorship and democracy. I mean, Talmud's analysis was to sort of basically focus on Rousseau's concept of the general will as anticipating sort of a kind of uniformizing, homogenizing entity, and so on. Arendt does not have much good to say about Rousseau in On Revolution either. Uh, but what she is um, concerned about, rather than a kind of critique of the general will as a kind of totalitarian fantasy, she is concerned about uh, the fact that this dialectic of legitimacy in the French Revolution refers to the nation, la, la nation, as the incorporator, and saying le, le tiers état c'est nous, you know, as the representative of the of the general uh, will. And she thinks this is the point at which you will lose a revolution. And here I come to the question of diversity, because the minute the nation emancipates itself from the rule of law and sees itself as the ultimate foundation of the law, rather than seeing itself as being bound by the law, this is the moment in which the nation is going to oppress its others. In the French Revolution, it was not the question of religious diversity or ethnic diversity. It was those who thought otherwise, the Girondin uh, versus the Jacobin. And one could keep inventing enemies of the revolution. Right? And this is what this is what she's concerned about. That, uh, in a sense, uh, if you wish, to contain that moment uh, by a paradoxical act of self-binding. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it, it, it's, now I'm going to. Amal said to me, "Are you going to talk about politics and not just, uh, you know?" Yeah, because I think I think this is the this is truly the dilemma. This is the difficult moment. I mean, it is an extremely difficult moment for human communities and societies to understand that we are living without historical teleologies and guarantees. That uh, you know, uh, we are destroying nature. Nature is not anymore, you know, a kind of wegweiser. It doesn't show us where to go. In some very fundamental way, we are alone, we as human beings. For some, this is intolerable, absolutely intolerable. This is why we have the return of traditionalism. This is why we have the return of authoritarianism galore, from you know, Trump to Erdogan to Putin to Netanyahu to Orban go on and on to task. It is now the political movement 
in our time that has emerged. What is it emerging against? It's emerging against the fact that we are alone and that if we are going to create these institutions, we will have to create them out of our own reason and will, and the increasing complexity, the increasing complexity that nation states can no longer manage. Be it the complexity of the economy, be it the complexity of the environment, be it the complexity of you know health scares, etc. So this is this is the difficulty. This is the difficulty in the moment of the political. As I say, I think for some this is too much. For some human beings, this is just absolutely, absolutely too much. For I, I think it's the challenge that Arendt uh, poses, and I like this moment. I like this image of uh, Ulysses and the, uh, and the uh, 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 sirens, or you know, sort of you know, since we are here in the Middle East, and you know, we have such a tangled up history, you know, um, the law is given, but you know, the city does not accept the law. The golden calf comes back, and Moses is furious, and he breaks, he breaks the. He breaks the tablets, right? What is that moment? What is that moment? It is that moment that you know the people simply do not say, "Aha, the law is given." It takes time to 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 accept this, to bind oneself, you know, to accept, to be bound. And I I think this is also important. Arendt's point about the relationship of nation and the law, because look, all nationalism and Zionism not excluded sees itself as the source of legitimacy. And because it does, it ends up with the paradoxes of the other. And here I come to what Amal was saying. Uh, uh, one minor point, Amal, yes, Schlar's work on justice is going to be part of the discussion. It's a very interesting work. And I think in some ways she was much more realistic in economic terms than Arendt was, who's thinking about the economy, is just not adequate. Okay? So I really take that point. But whose tradition and who are we and how do we think of plur pluralism? Uh, let me just uh, uh, answer now uh, textually. When Schlar mentioned the term social diversity at the very beginning of the book, legalism, I was always puzzled uh, by the fact that we didn't know what social diversity was really, what she had in mind. There is no, uh, does she think classes, ethnic groups, religious groups, uh, genders, or nations? I don't, you know, there is no further specification of this problem of diversity in a very interesting way. In the section on natural law, she takes on the question of the natural law defense against homosexuality, and she really does a job. There is this famous debate in, in uh, British law earlier, you know, with Hart. I'm not remembering the opponent of Hart. Maybe Leora will remember, or somebody here will. But but it's interesting that Schlar that this the you know sort of trashes uh, this natural law against you know, uh, homosexuality, and, and you know, there is that. But the concept of diversity and um, the concept of pluralism are not, are not further specified. And as you know, in um, a liberal political philosophy following Schlar uh, in the work of Rawls, and by the way, Rawls and Schlar really were very good colleagues at Harvard, and they admired each other from a distance, although she's not the kind of foundational liberal theorist the way Rawls is, there was a great deal of affinity uh, in their work. And in, as you know, in Rawls's work, diversity always refers to the diversity of worldviews and fundamental value conflicts. There's never, you know, diversity is never the pluralism of ethnic religious and other groups, this question about pluralism in that sense uh, as ethno or religious cultural pluralism comes up into liberal theory first with the work of Kimlicka. 
And this is, this is a moment in sort of Anglo-American political thought just in the 60s and so on, where, you know, there is, uh, it's, not, it's not at all, it's not at all thematized. So when you say uh, it's not enough to mention plurality as a social ontology rather than as an analytical pos position, also with Arendt, who emphasizes plurality a great deal, uh, I, I, um, I, I agree with you. But as you know, you know, in the work that I have done in other writings, uh, the problem is always, for me at least, to be able to find to a kind of normativity of the universal without disintegrating into relativism or, you know, uh, sheer anarchism or, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, this has been the challenge for me of another cosmopolitanism, that is, uh, how, to, how to defend the universal. And um, in, uh, the question of Benjamin, uh, I'm going to be brief here, but I do have two more points to make. Uh, we talked um, a little bit again about that essay, um, Zu Kritik der Gewalt. And I mentioned the fact that although Arendt and Benjamin were very close friends, and she really, she really was completely affectionate about him. And I don't know if you've been looking at this Gershom Scholem and Theodor Adorno correspondence that just got out. Uh, it's in German. I don't know if it's also in Hebrew, because these are all letters in the Scholem archives. And they are talking about Benjamin's legacy, and they both hate her. <laughs> they both, you know, it's just a lot of misogyny there. Uh, but they both, you know, hate her and her appropri appropriation of Benjamin's legacy as if she were the only, blah, 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 blah. Okay. It's interesting from a theoretical point of view that she never discussed Benjamin's essay on violence. Um, and I don't think, as the French would say, ce n'est pas par hasard. I don't think that she thought that Benjamin was a political thinker, period. And thesis on the philosophy of history was as far as she was willing to go. Now, if you push me about that, that essay, um, that, uh, as others have also said, this notion of a rechtswaltende Gewalt, you know, violence, what? How do we translate Walten? Violence administering, violence generating, as opposed to violence uh, giving uh, you know, power. Uh, it is political theology. It is Schmidt. It is a gesture. It is a gesture, which you know Benjamin also calls divine violence at one point, divine power. Um, Hannah Arendt herself <coughs> cannot accept this. Does not accept it. She is not a thinker of political theology. Uh, she never was. All those analogies between her and Schmidt at that level are wrong. And, uh, but for me, what is troubling about this essay is that there is, so much, there is so much flirtation with it, also on the part of left thinkers, as if by continuously sort of, you know, this frisson that we have, you know, coming to the moment of you know, this divine violence, and so on. after that, I'm too much of a rationalist. I don't know what all this means. Or at some point, if I do know, I just find it so dangerous in politics, like aren't I want to say, bind Ulysses to the sirens, give me a constitution. This is, you know, this is, mm -hmm. or you, you know, give me our own Barak. I don't want divine, divine violence, if I can speak in, you know, in Israeli political, <laughs> political terms. But this is not a philosophical, a philosophical answer, answer um, exactly. So in a sense, uh, you are right that I, I should, um, I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to, you know, say 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 my piece about about um, uh, Benjamin there because the temptation to think about this this um, violence. Okay, um, we cannot not think about politics without violence, and maybe this is the point at which I'm still with my teacher Jürgen Habermas, but I'm beginning to, you know maybe, and I'm having this conversation with uh, 
uh, Derrida and others, because I do believe that uh, we have not said enough about the problem of violence. Okay? But whether we have to think of this as Benjamin does, and you know, just like that, as divine violence. Okay. okay. Uh, what do we, are we going to say that at the foundation of all uh, violence is divine violence so that the other is a kurban? Is a kurban? Is that what we want to say? You know? Uh, I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't get me started on Schmidt's political theology, friend and, you know, friend and foe, and all attempts to just simply civilize him and read this as if it's all about democratic antagonism. Yeah, but it's not just about democratic antagonism. Please read the text. My friend, Chantal Mouffe, it drives me crazy. When Schmidt says the politic, all politics is based upon the discussion of friend and foe, and he starts parsing out what the foe means, and he says in the concept of the political, the foe is an existential other. The foe is an existential other whose way of life, who, whose way of life is so different than me, is so other than me. So what is this? This is ontologizing the otherness of the other. Where does this get us? It gets us into war. It gets us into perpetual conflict. It gets us into disaster. You know, so this uncritical reading of Schmidt, this uncritical, you know, maybe appropriation of Benjamin, it all comes from a sense of the failure of the left, a hatred of liberalism, that somehow maybe by going back to these militant, violent moments, we're going so. Yeah, you mm -hmm. opened, Great. you, you I, opened I, a can of work. <laughs> I intended. <laughs> so. You intended. You intended. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me let me come back to the final uh, statement um, uh, that you quote from my former student, also actually Adi Ophir, the status closure. Uh, there are two terms that I have uh, um, learned uh, from Robert Cover who is uh, a kind of, uh, in my opinion, underestimated but very powerful legal, legal thinker whose work um, maybe is uh, now becoming received also in Israel. Um, he was a, a practicing uh, a Jew, so pro professor at Yale Law School. He wrote incredibly interesting work on law and violence and um, the nomos, the nomos of the law. And I find in Cover's work not only a deep thinking about diversity, but he also introduced these two terms, Juris generativity and Juris pathos. Juris generativity is a concept that both Michaelman and I and others have been using now to talk about this interactive relationship between uh, law and politics, and law not just as order, as gebot or febot, law not just as what you must do, but law also as generating the fundamental norms that make uh, human coexistence possible. That the law is a kind of normative generativity that permits, uh, as with civil rights movements, women's movements, LBGT movements, new actors and new vocabularies to emerge and new public spheres to be creative, that Euris generative moment. But there is, of course, also a Euris pathic moment. The Euris pathic moment is when there is monopoly of interpretation. I mean, maybe this is also what Annabel means by the openness of tradition. When there is that monopoly of interpretation by whatever instance in society, of course, in a sense, the law is also a closed system. It's also legalism, as you know, Judith Klar said. But it isn't. It isn't uh, just that. Particularly, constitutional traditions are always inherently political, and constitutional discussions are always also about the political, not just not just about the uh, about the legal. So the moment of closure, the status closure, is that moment of Euris pathos, the moment when. Uh, uh, the monopoly of interpretation closes uh, of the space of the political. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Maybe I went on a little too long, but I'd like to hear your questions.
Thank you very much. Would you like us to collect questions or do you want to answer one by one? What would you prefer? Collecting is fine. Depends on how much time we have. And we, maybe are, I should we have very it. brief time, so it has to be brief questions. Uh, <clears throat> would you like to start? I thought you were, at some point you were talking about confusing tautologized law, and at other points, and then at the end we said U.S. gender activity, which seems like an account of law as law, which has no other than legal origin. So I'm a, I'm a little confused. Is, is there, does, can law be explained on the basis of non-law? Does it emerge out of non-law, out of social forces, out of political decision, out of a Grunloy, or is it law all the way down because it's interpretation of all the way down and what's being interpreted is always law? Okay. Um, okay. Well, thank you for your uh, lecture. Um, I like very much your critique on conflict because he, he became in Israel so some uh, hero in political science. So thank you. My uh, informative question is, what uh, did Schlaf thought about Eichmann trail? And what did uh, Hannah Arendt thought about Nirenberg uh, trails? Uh, okay, we'll collect some and then we are. Thank you, Sheila, for your fascinating talk. I, wanted to, I want to, to ask you an interpretive question, because this is your project and to add some points that you took out of Arendt and uh, of Schlaf. So I'm interested in your, I think you're right that the interest in the foundation of law is very uh, um, central to the, to the problem of political life to put in the center of the Now, I think that uh, about this foundation, or about the Mentioning, you talked about Arendt and the Nomos and uh, Schmidt. I think what is interesting in her uh, answer to Schmidt is her reinterpretation of territory completely and uh, as non uh, uh, landish or earthish uh, interpretation, but territory as, co uh, as a community that is uh, uh, created by language, tradition, culture, and so forth. So I think this is a, um, this is a, a, a way for her to to bring in a, a, a new interpretation of uh, plurality. Now, as to Schlar, uh, I think what is interesting uh, about uh, um, her understanding of uh, community in legalism is that and, that, and you put it out, is that she differentiates between the Nuremberg trial and the Tokyo trial by looking at, uh, she says that legalism is justified as an ethos only in relation to the community that uh, uh, the trial is trying to talk to. And, uh, and I think uh, this is why she also says that the Eichmann trial is a Jewish problem, because she looked at it as a trial talking to uh, uh, Jewish politics there. So, so it's interesting to put in the community into her uh, 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 theory of legalism. And lastly, about uh, the dangers of uh, uh, criminal international law today lapsing into um, a new legalism in the sense of ideology. Uh, I think in, it is interesting to look at the concept of complementarity and to enlarge it according to your concept of iterable terribility in the sense that it's not just complementarity in the sense that you look at the community and see whether they are investigating or prosecuting, but the way they are taking the, the same concept and play with it or uh, 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 reinterpret it. So I think this is the creative element in international criminal law that is being lost today by being reduced into rules that, uh, that are coming from Hague, the Hague, and this is the only interpretation that can be accepted. So I think this is the way to tie it. Great, uh, I've been asked uh, uh, to have only one last uh, question. So this is a, 
difficult uh, uh, choice. So I'm going to ask you one question and to explain well, my, exploit, uh, my status know. as a chair. I just want to ask you one question concerning the relations, uh, relationship between politics and law or politics and police. And uh, to add something in this relation, some political faults that I think it's, it's important to open and beyond the question of the violence of the Founding Act and the secularity of the Founding Act. And I think it's uh, through Agamemnon's reading, Agamemnon's reading of Schmidt, we became very worried, wary and alert of these faults that uh, 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 mark the ways in which every foundation of spaces of life over which the law uh, protects and uh, uh, gives its patronage are always at the same time, uh, simultaneously, marking uh, spaces of life of, uh, from which the law withdraws its protection. And, it's, and many times it's within, in the police and not only beyond the confines of the police. And in these areas, the spaces usually leave uh, habitants which are not citizens, uh, subjects which are not citizens, that are held to the law by a uh, way of uh, exclusive inclusion or inclusive exclusion. And I think it is important to refer to these falls of the law and the relations between law and politics, not in, only in this traumatized place that we live here, but also in Europe now that is flooded with refugees and uh, non-citizen and stateless so I wonder if you can also refer to these polls. Thank you, and I apologize for all the other ones. Yeah, uh, thanks, um, uh, Michael. Uh, uh, you asked me uh, the question, is it law all the way down, uh, ontological uh, origins and um, the grund norm? I think that we need to, if I were to try to handle this question systematically, and as I said, I'm doing an exploratory uh, uh, paper here, there is one term that is missing in the discussion, and that is legitimacy. Because it is not just about legality, it is also about legitimacy. That is the normative conviction that orders issued from a given source deserve obedience. This is Max Weber's analysis of legitimacy. Uh, Schklar never distinguishes properly between legality and legitimacy. And uh, there is a whole discussion about how and whether legal rational authority is sufficient to create democratic legitimacy. My answer to that is no. It is not. Uh, I do not find the question about the uh, origins um, uh, of uh, law as such uh, easy to answer in, in, without putting in the question about legitimacy. Because if we are asking a historical question, if we are asking a historical, anthropological, sociological question, of course, law emerges out of a social context, custom convention, divine authority, et cetera. So, but that's not the question that we are asking. We are asking a normative question. And if we are asking the normative question, we need a third term. And that term is legitimacy. And you do not find a theory of legitimacy in Schlar's work. And in Arendt's work, uh, I think it's something that needs to be pulled out. That's why you know I wrote about the missing normative foundations of politics in, in Arendt's work. So. Uh, that would that would be that would be one way in which I would go about it. Um, now, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Leora. Let me just uh, so both you and the gentleman are, are concerned about this. Eichmann, Nuremberg, Arendt, and Schlar on these questions. But let me just say I do have a big footnote to Schlar's very skeptical comments on Tokyo, the Tokyo trials, and. Uh, in fact, um, she is so skeptical that sometimes you might, you know, you might sort of wonder whether it is a version of, you know, a critique of Eurocentrism or whether it is a form of racism. I mean, she does, she thought that the whole Tokyo trials were a travesty, and here is what you know she says, commenting on Mr. Keenan's claim, quote, that the Christian Judaic 
absolutes of good and evil had universal validity, Schlar says, what on earth could the Judeo-Christian ethic mean to the Japanese? Question mark. Okay. Um, that's a difficult statement, isn't it? On the one hand, you can say, well, yeah, no conversation is possible, no translation is possible. This is a critique of ethnocentrism. And it is. I and mean, she thought that this prosecutor was quite ridiculous. But on the other hand, it does raise the question of um, um, conversation across uh, tra traditions and whether there is any way in which to uh, sort of peel out the universal core of international criminal law without going into this self-congratulatory language of, you know, Judeo-Christian. I never know what the hell that hyphen means anyway. So, you know, I find this discussion of the Tokyo trials very, very interesting, but at the same time, somewhat, somewhat uh, difficult. Also, uh, completely agreeing with you about this problem of complementarity of criminal international law. Uh, the reason why Samuel Moyne, I don't know if you've seen his reading of Schklar, but the reason why uh, he's reading Schklar is actually to draw the wrong conclusion from it, namely to read Schklar as a complete skeptic about international criminal law, which I think is itself a very you know, dangerous, uh, you know, uh, self-undermining um, uh, process because, as we know, the complementarity um, and it goes in many ways. You know, right? Not only that the international criminal court comes when domestic national courts do not undertake the action, but as you were saying, there is this creative interpretive moment as well. Uh, what did Arendt think about Nuremberg? She thought it was okay. She didn't say much about it. And when she writes about it in Eichmann in Jerusalem, she thinks that the London agreement on which Nuremberg is based is also creates some kind of a precedent for Israel because it has been incorporated also into Israeli uh, law uh, um, in uh, some way. So she didn't really, she doesn't really give a, a, an analysis, but she's of course very writes prolifically about the question of organized guilt and responsibility. Uh, I think there is, in the you know, the posthumous writings that are coming out now extensively, there may be uh, one or two more specific essays that I'm not familiar with, but I remember having seen in the index that maybe she came back to it. You know, so, for her, the question was always organized guilt and responsibility, and how can you prove it? And you know, she never accepted either for the new is there the cog in the machine theory? You have to be able to prove legal responsibility. And her disagreement with Gideon Hausner was that Hausner tried to prove that Eichmann was a monster. Mm -hmm. She thought Eichmann was guilty without being a monster. Mm -hmm. That was the that was the the, the question, but. As I say, there may be a little bit more now in these posthumous uh, writings coming out. Now, um, Schklar's uh, comment about the Eichmann trial is puzzling, other than the interpretation that Leora gave to it, that, you know, that there is a community, uh, that the international law is the law as interpreted by a uh, community itself. Um, um, but. I will still stand by this question that I think that without the Eichmann trial, you cannot get at the question of crimes against humanity and genocide effectively. And so I, I believe that maybe, I mean, she did not give a principled justification, as Leora is trying to say, when you're going to apply international law, also have a community of interpretation and nomos a people that stands behind it, uh, I think that there was a, a kind of anxiety, anxiety of, of influence uh, there. But I'm, I'm happy to think more about it. You know, I mean, it's a puzzle. Agamben, not fond of him either, <laughs> but be that as it may. Uh, spaces of life from which law withdraws in its protection um, 
I think there's a, there's a paradox here that we see from Guantanamo to the refugee question. The issue is not that the law is withdrawing. The issue is that the law is being pushed out. And it, it is important to how you conceptualize it. Uh, in the case of uh, Guantanamo, even though you know people think that this is just simply a, a dark hole without any law, uh, the US Supreme Court ruled that even though the US does not have territorial sovereignty, it has functional sovereignty over Guantanamo because the law applies. It's the US. You know, so there is this difference between functional and territorial concept that they made. So, But despite all this, what I think has happened is the attempt of all states to create black holes or spaces with renditions and so on. Uh, how, do you, how do you explain this? Um, if I read him correctly, for Agamben, the state of exception is the repetition of the same. For me, it's not. Um, I would say that you cannot even conceptualize the refugee problem as a refugee problem without the Geneva Conventions of 1951, without their protocol, without everything else. The refugees today in Europe are in the strange space that they are, and believe me, I've been writing about this and doing some work. They are in the strange space that they are stuck in Greece because their applications for asylum have to be examined under international law. Now, this is the moment at which the law almost turns into its opposite. It turns into violence. Right? And um, it, the, what is uh, happening is also, and I know you have a lot of discussion about refugee law you know, and Geneva Conventions in Israel, and I have had enough colleagues from Israel and students to know that you're, you know, the governments are giving a very nationalistic interpretation to their obligations under the, under the convention. But we can't even begin to talk about the refugee problem as an issue. Uh, uh, who is the refugee, who is the asylum seeker, without understanding this network of obligations, right? I mean, if the refugees were just the stateless of Hannah Arendt's time, then they became superfluous peoples, okay? But today, uh, uh, you know, and I'm not talking about the Palestinian refugees, I'm talking about Europe's refugees, the current, the, current, uh, the current crisis, because the Palestinian refugee situation is regulated, as you know, by this UN convent, by this UN article, whatever you all know what uh, number that, that is, and they're in a permanent state. You might say they're, they're in a permanent state of exception. Okay? I'm not sure how fundamental this disagreement is, but, you know, whether the law withdraws or is pushed back, or how or how thick this network, or how thick this network is, but um, I mean, it, in an absurd way, our world has created uh, these categories of people. Refugees in protracted situation, um, a convention refugees versus economic migrants. These are all creations of a new vocabulary. And, and they are many times absurd. <coughs> Absurd. I don't. I mean, but this is another conversation. But the question that we must ask is whether we operate with the imminent contradictions, or whether we just say we scrap the whole thing. And I think it's better to work with the imminent contradictions from within of the convention and their protocols, because states want nothing more today than to free themselves from the obligations of international law. Viktor Orban, Tusk, Putin, the Israeli government on and off, Erdogan, you name them. OK, I'm sorry to you. Thank you very much.